All right, so this is the class for August 31st. And because I'm gonna be flying next Monday, we are going to have the next class on Wednesday and then the class on Friday. Okay. Okay, is that okay, Liam? And then yeah. Ivy, I hope you hear this and I'll email Ivy too, so. All right, so the next thing is for you to give your reactions to Berger and you might want to point out if you understand why I assigned the things the way I did, because Collingwood does talk about, you know, the Romans, I mean, Plato and the Romans and the New World, and he gives a certain take on it, right? Yeah. He's, he's constructing history, just like Berger says, everything we talk about history is a construction, and it's usually motivated, it's motivated by something in the constructor, right? Yeah. Okay. And that's the way art works too, and that's the way art historians work. Mm -hmm. So I did want to give you a sense that the the work, the stuff I assign is intended to sort of be in a conversation with each other and with us. So what did you what did you get for the first? What's your reactions? So I think one of the main points was that there were different ways of seeing men and women like it was it was like looking through two different lenses i think um and if 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 it was on the right thing um it was kind of like when looking at a woman it was a, a very different experience more of like a um uh, look at this object thing like if it were a bowl of fruit and then i can't remember the points he made on looking at a man um, well, a man is what he can do. Okay. And a woman is what can be done to her. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. I so so for con for for context, my version of Burger hasn't come in yet, and I didn't find it on classroom. So I found a PDF, which I hope was right, um, as well as reading the newspaper clippings, and um, I actually haven't gone over the notes yet but that would be helpful <laughs> or that probably okay. would have been helpful. I mean, we could reschedule this class. Um, um, all right, so you ought to let me know these things um, yeah. because then I could scan them um, anyway. Okay, so I guess we'll piece together something, but um, the class would go a lot better. <laughs> It, yeah, I'm sorry. If, this is uh, on me. Um, well, if it didn't come in, I suppose you could have ordered it months ago, you know. Yeah. Um, have you got everything else ordered? Um, right now I have um, Collingwood, Tolstoy's What is Art. Um, oh, God, I have three more, but I can't remember. Oh, no, well, I have four if more. they're the ones that I said... On beauty, I mean, beauty is very important. I think, oh heck, I don't remember if that one came out. I that, don't know, they're in my room. That comes, it's at the last of the class, but it really is important because I can't scan that stuff. Yeah. I'm bringing that book with me to Indonesia because I can't, um, I'm not gonna scan the whole book. <laughs> yeah. And I do assign quite a bit of it, so. Um, All right, well. Yeah, the, um, I ordered them, I think, right as the first day of class. So I don't know why things aren't here. Right. Because um, it's yeah. been about two weeks, which was the longest time it should have been. Yeah, well, those things happen. So, all right, what I'll do then for this class, I'm going to summarize what okay. we've done so far. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Because it does all fit together. Yeah. Um, all right, so I'm going to go back to, oh, come on. Oh, there, the, all right. I'm going to go back to um, 
I'm going to go all the way back to May, Rollo May. All right. Okay. We can start comparing them because everything is pretty cosmic, right? Art is about everything. Yeah. And everything is, is people will call art anything also. So we got to figure out how these different views, you juxtapose them to each other because a lot of it is what they're not saying, right? What are they leaving out? Uh, that the other person thinks is really important, right? That's why you get a lot of disagreements is they keep talking past each other. So, so Rollo May is a psychiatrist and he thinks we have an innate sense. And so it's in our psyche, but it's built into our psyche. And so he's talking about psychological activities um, and art helps put the psyche in its proper order, right? We have a natural reaction to proportion, balance, harmony, because it's actually out there. And so an artist and aesthetic experience actually enables us to see what's actually out there. But it gets filtered through our imagination and then we create form, right? So, the artist is trying to actualize some understanding of beauty that has come into their mind. It's an endeavor to realize beauty. So it's an endeavor to get us in some sense in touch with the universe and with ourselves um, and with each other, right? It's an yeah. inner urge to express how we see the world, but it also integrates, right? the unconscious and the conscious, um, it's ecstatic. It's outside of banal consciousness. So banal consciousness is mostly socially constructed. I mean, when we're just reacting, trying to adapt to our society, I mean, we spend most of our energy doing all that, right? Reacting to people in order to get along, reacting to fulfilling requirements. Um, and some societies, are more in tune with this underlying order than others, or some people are, or different times in your life, you can get closer or farther different times in the day. But the banal consciousness is um, a result of integrating yourself with whatever has been socially constructed that you have to adapt to at that particular time in your life or time and place in the day. Does that make sense? Yeah. So art gets you outside of that because its root is more natural, right? So it has to get you um, outside of that sense of self. And artists are more aware, like they try to stay in touch with that. Um, so Newton, Einstein, math, science, um, and then Mount Blanc, do you remember he's, he looks at how it appears, but then he starts to see the form, see a deeper sense of form to it. And then the way that human beings naturally seek out these deeper things and they naturally, and they do it through their senses, right? That's what I like about art, right? It uses your sensuality. It doesn't deny the fact that you are a seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching creature. <clears throat> but that's why you need art because that part of you is gonna to respond to what's right out in front of you unless the artist can sort of take you out of that and help you educate you to see a much broader context for these things. And when the peasants, when people dance, sing, uh, create clothing and dishes that <clears throat> appeals to sensuality, but pulls you out into a broader world of form and order. That's a way to maintain integrity. That's a, that's a kind of ethic. And it's a way to avoid violence, right? Because you can see things in this broader context. Um, so tragedy is, as a matter of fact, 
in our banal consciousness, we become very aware of fear, right? Because we're very vulnerable. So fear <coughs> drives us often to do violent things or to um, lie, cheat, steal, be jealous. I mean, all those really negative emotions are tied to survival. Um, and so tragedy helps you recreate situations that anybody could get into that even if you might identify with, but even if you don't, you can understand it. I could someday or somebody I know, and you cough up all that stuff so that you're aware that I'm capable of this, but then you see what destruction it does. It seems like it's what somebody wants to do at the time, but long-term it's really um, not the thing to do. So um, you flush that out so you can reaffirm the value of life. And you also can get back in touch with natural beauty and form. And these things happen in our day-to-day -day life. Like when you're on a boat and you see a sunset and everybody can appreciate it. Um, Aristotle's view, everything fits together. And Plato's view, there's this underlying unity. I don't think these two are at all at odds, but it doesn't matter. The main point is there is an underlying um, bigger context within which we live. Um, okay, um, our natural drive to create leads to a feeling of grace, joy, peace, a sense that life is worth living. Um, so great art interprets our deepest symbols and myths. Um, so then I'm going to go to um, Collingwood and the original questions. What does Collingwood think? So, um, Art, so Liam, why don't you just tell me, just react to some of this stuff while I'm talking about it? Okay. Um, I didn't know. Go, go I, ahead, Liam. Um, I actually did think of something earlier um, because according to May, that art acts on like the basic and primal. I thought of the brain, <clears throat> the brain in the jar scenario where you, where a person would just be a brain in the jar with no senses because they are detached from the outside world. And I was wondering how much of um, May's interpretation would still affect the, the, let's say the jar man. Um, okay, yeah. Well, because so, it it applies or it it affects something that's deeper, but because there's no senses, they couldn't perceive another art. But because art, um, what is it, calls to a, a deeper sense, would they still be able to like conjure, not conjure art, but to to imagine and create art in their head without actually using the um, skills to create an actual physical object or um, like sonnet or something? Okay, so that's a good question in the sense that there's a fundamental break between ancient psychology and theory of art and modern. Why? Because um, in the modern world, the psyche is a blank slate. So you could have a brain in a jar, but all it would have in it is literally sensual, immediate sense experience and maybe memory. There's no can tie in to the universe. They cut it off, right? And so ancient people would never have thought experiments like that because they're worthless, right? The yeah. natural object of our brain is the universe. And there's no way that a brain in a vat ever interacted with the universe. So if wisdom is for you to become a microcosm in the macrocosm, a brain in a vat is nothing. But the reason those thought experiments are popular, like John Searle, I guess, is because you have this view that all you are 
is every sensuous experience that you've ever had, the blank slate, and maybe some genetic stuff tied in there. Okay. That, okay. That's so, really different. Does that make sense, Liam? I, I think so. So you're saying that because of the break between the, the ancient and the modern world, the ancient world wouldn't even, A, wouldn't consider this, and B, would think that it's irrelevant because instead of being the, the, the blank slate that is then a collection of um, sensuous experiences, in the ancient world, um, it would be more, you are this continuous, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say noodle in the soup, like the cosmic soup of the universe. And because you are, there is not, a, not only no reason to think of separating the mind from the rest of it, but to separate the mind from the sensuous experience stealing from the, the modern world would be um, not useless, but it wouldn't lead to any uh, total differences other than just a lack of physical experiences. Well, you're just trying to reduce the human mind to basically the same as um, other animals, you know? Oh, okay. Right? Okay. I think, I think, okay, I think that, that put it together. So it's, it's, yeah, yeah. So that's just the error in the way that I'm, I'm thinking and putting it is that I'm putting it into, like you said, just the, the senses and putting humans as animals where the ancients definitely would have been like, well, humans are because we think and the more metaphysical aspect of our consciousness, right? Something like that. Right. So, um, so noodle in the soup isn't a good analogy because the noodle just floats around, right? Oh, yeah. um, so the spoon. If you have a mind, it, the, the universe is ordered in a way that soup is not, right? Yeah. And so there's an order there. And we evolved because we were adaptive. Why were we adaptive? Because we figured out the order, right? We started to see patterns. We and then we recognized that we are the creature that sees patterns. That's what animals can't do. They see patterns, they have memories. They interact with each other in sometimes very thoughtful, I mean, what looks like thoughtful ways, right? But yeah. they aren't aware that they're aware, right? Does that yeah. make sense? Okay, but once human beings became aware that they are aware, <laughs> then they start to recognize, to use mathematics as a language to understand the patterns in the universe. The Pythagoreans thought everything is number, right? The whole universe is number, why? Because everything is ordered. Now I would say that number measures the order that's out there, right? Number isn't the most fundamental force. It's another force that keeps, that maintains an order. And then we are capable of abstracting that because we keep recognizing patterns. So we understand patterns. We use, we use number to, to create a measurement to describe those patterns, then we can create other mathematical formula and patterns that are detached from the natural world, which is what we've obviously done, right? That's how we got computers, right? That whole world is a world that involves math and pattern recognition, but it's completely detached from the natural world and it's obviously created its own virtual reality. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, that is what happened in the modern world. And we just keep going there. Part of us, part of the society goes that way. But another part is absolutely destroying life on earth. And we ought to be paying attention to that other aspect of life, which is we are a microcosm in the macrocosm. And we can't keep doing this. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that loops. At least I think it loops to the finite sense of reality and as the only beings that can kind of sense that 
we have this kind of duty to make sure that it's all sustained. We have awareness of choice, right? Okay. Yeah. We are, but it's that flash of recognition that we are the creature that understands patterns in a universe where the patterns exist. That's what animals don't have. And it's people, you know, people don't want to say, no, as soon as we think we're better. No, it doesn't mean we're morally better. It means we could be way worse and we have been way worse than any animal could be, yeah. right? It just gives us moral responsibility. It gives us choice, awareness of choice. It doesn't make us superior in any way. It makes us more complicated and more responsible, right? Um, but you know why people hesitate. They don't want us to be superior, right? We're just sophisticated gorillas or something. And it, because the way we treat animals, be, you know, again, in the modern world, because we're superior, we can use nature for our own purposes. That's what God wants. And of course, that's offensive, especially now, the way we treat animals, my God, to create products. But that doesn't mean we're no, you know, we're no different. We are different um, in a way that makes us potentially better or worse than any other animal could be. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, you know, if you go to grad school, you'll probably hear about John Searle and the brain and the bat. So you can just say, well, Dr. Beck doesn't know what's popular or doesn't care or whatever. Um, you can decide for yourself what you want, but I, I just think it's awful. And um, it's... Yeah. Okay. I, I definitely see the big issue with brain of the bat is that it does entirely separate the, um, I mean, what is it? It separates the human from reality because in no scenario are we actually going to have a brain of that that has never experienced something else. And I think, I think one of the reasons that's a popular is it's like, well, what is the, what is the slate or what is the starting point of consciousness? So it's more of a question of consciousness and that, completely takes out the formative years of um, the human brain. And it's just this big, like, what if that might not even have a what to it? It's just if. Well, and you could do the same for a gorilla or an ape or a cow or anything, right? Yeah. What would the cow's brain in a vat be like? And so when human beings are interacting with the universe, they need to make that leap from just taking things in, recognizing patterns, having a memory, in a, in a way, predicting stuff, right? You could tell that animals can tell where predator and prey are based on their, their, their brains have imprinted these patterns. You know, this kind of environment would be where the prey are, we gotta go. I mean, no, but they're not aware of their awareness. And yeah. they also don't make a leap to, oh, the universe has patterns and I'm recognizing a pattern, right? Or yeah. that there's a biosphere out there and I'm in the biosphere and this is the part of it in the big chart, you know, of the chain of being and all that. These, this, this is how my species survived because, and this is how it adapted. So we eat the kind of stuff that's in the environment where we evolved, right? Yeah. You see, none of that, no animal is ever gonna understand that. But the trouble is when you have brain in the vat, you have a whole educational system that doesn't even point that out to kids. So they don't think that way. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, okay. So when you take math, how do you study math? Do you study math as the reason we can do math is because the universe is ordered and our brains over time were able to um, recognize it, formulate it into uh, patterns through number. Um, 
But eventually we're also able to abstract those patterns to create our own just completely imaginative, unnatural patterns. We're also able to take that capacity and make skyscrapers and make you know all sorts of uh, unnatural. We exploit natural resources and we create this whole new culture that's just based on exploitation and creates this whole new reality, right? We yeah. did that in the modern industrial age and now in the high tech age, we've got people living in every sort of virtual reality you can imagine. Um, but I'd say to their detriment in a lot of ways. Does that make sense? Yeah. It sells products, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, capitalism is always interested in the latest new product. And in order to have the latest new product, you've got to be, have your mind completely detached from any natural need. Yeah. And art is a way to um, reiterate those necessary or natural feelings, right? Well, that's the idea, right? It's yeah. a way to try to find something authentic in the midst okay. of all this crap, right? And and Collingwood specifically calls out that there is there are creations that are not not artist, not fully artistic, but that they are more for the consumption when the magic is something that actually is an art that calls to the deeper sense, right? Right. Well, he's trying to call out all the stuff that's crap. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then the artist is, call, is calling out false consciousness. So in a way, calling Wood's book is a kind of art, right? Mm -hmm. So philosophy can be art. So if an artist creates a picture, like Berger says, the picture that Rembrandt painted of his second wife, Berger's claim is that he's really in love with her. This isn't the garbage of nudity and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and that's Collingwood will say, you know, that there's artists try to have these deep and powerful emotions, right? And those can be something positive, like what it's a painting where you really are in love with another human being and you manage to communicate that on paper. Um, but a lot of what he's calling out is the artist is exposing false consciousness and they're showing, you know, like I always think of rap music. It's just showing us that we are not post-racial and that we have created a culture that has molded black kids to be angry legitimately. But I mean, now they're just driven by fear and anger because they've grown up and since they were born in these environments that just trigger fear all the time. And so then they're gonna get violent, obviously. Um, yeah. So we have to change the way we, you know, we've got to change our society. So it's, but it doesn't, you know, it's not a rabble rousing political, you got to vote Democrat or something. It's just trying to express how it feels to be a black person who grew up in these environments that really are the result of, of radical racism in housing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, anyway, so, so the artist still wants to find that ecstatic experience, right? That place where our minds really are in tune with something deeper, right? Yeah. And it's from that place that they also can expose false consciousness. Or if you start at that place, then the false consciousness sort of exposes itself. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, let's see. So it's an imaginative experience. Um, art is a way of life. What do you think? What did you think of that? Um, I, I do I do agree with it. I mean, to I think there is a separation between 
people that do and people that don't uh not really take but people that do and people that don't let's say use art in their daily life where they don't think about it they don't um they don't have it around it's more of a passive existence you could say um like thinking of the difference between like I guess some of my high school teachers versus others, some would have have like artistic pieces that not only would they just use in their daily life, like they'd have it because it evokes something from them. Like, let's say it's it's their phone screen. And every time that they open their phone, they see it and they'll half the time they'll pause and they'll be like, oh my God, that is a really good painting. And then it evokes more and it helps them move on with the different with, with different thoughts. Whereas others, they are perfectly fine living as they are and there is no want or desire to connect further with anything deeper it is just kind of a continuation of what yesterday was um it's banal banal consciousness right yeah um all right so did you go to my speech on friday yes the colloquia okay. did you go oh you didn't go to the three o'clock okay well, the main idea, I think, is that I would think that when your teachers have that, it's an ecstatic, it reminds them of an ecstatic experience, which they have to constantly remember, why did I go into teaching, right? Because yes. teaching is a calling, and you have to keep remembering that so that you can approach the student with that broader understanding that you have a calling to help students move forward in a meaningful way in life, right? Find their calling, but also you have to, students have to learn, they have to do things they don't like, but that's part of life lessons so they can ultimately do what they do like, right? It's just yeah. constantly, I think that's what those teachers probably do, right? They try to get outside of the banal, to keep approaching the classroom from the point of view of an, a natural need students have, this natural sense of calling the teacher has. Um, but, I, but I mean, the teachers that don't keep remembering that, if they just start remembering day after day, having to tell a kid to shut up and sit straight, they're just not gonna, right? It's they're going through the motions yeah. or they're getting mad, right? They're starting to pit themselves against students. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, that it's it's not it, it's not about um at yeah, I guess it's not about education and if you are um banal, right? Right. It's yeah. there's an art of living, there's an art of teaching, right? Yeah. It's it's not it shouldn't be a banal job. Right? Yeah. But actually there shouldn't be any banal jobs because the actual activity in a job might be pretty banal, but the context, right? You're still relating to people. You're furthering their careers. You're giving them income so they can provide for their families. You know, I don't think any job should ever be thought of as just exploiting people, you know, or getting yeah. exploited so you can survive. It, as soon as it becomes that, the spirit of it is completely different and what people will put up with and what people will do to each other if they have that. It's, you know, you could say it's a cynical view. Yeah. But it's not just cynical, it's just a false view, <laughs> right? Yeah. And it's just not true that we are creatures just who eat and sleep and whatever. It's just a lie. And when you sort of structure your life that way, you're extremely unhappy. Mm -hmm. And you'll do extremely unnatural things. You'll do to others on what you would never want done to you. And you know, that messes with your brain, right? Yeah. You're completely undermining your natural desire to understand anything. Um, and I think when religion becomes 
mostly motivated by fear, right? Then it gets really ugly. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. But um, anyway, like we're going to go through religion because religion is, again, a powerful tool and artists have definitely been involved with religious, right? Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, like, you can just take one look at a, at a Catholic church and then compare it to a Protestant church and think for like two minutes and you've got a few conclusions you can draw. Right. But you know why that's true? Because Paul was trying to convert people yeah. or the early Christians and they couldn't do it. The, you know, the Greeks, the pagans, until they stole their art. <laughs> yeah, then, I, then it was easy. <laughs> what? Then it was easy. Yeah, and, that's how they, yeah. And so the Catholic Church really stole all those artistic, like your guardian angel is like the Greek gods, right? I mean, you have to sort of reform it, but it's the same psychological insights about how to get people to really you know, <laughs> yeah. go along. Well, you have to get them to take pleasure. You have to have singing and dancing and, you know, visual stuff and all sorts of stuff. And then people will, you know, go along with it. Um, all right. So uh, what's the difference? So the goal of art, in, okay, it's not just expression because that can turn into therapy or, you know, there's a difference right yeah um it includes imagination emotion expands consciousness right whereas therapy doesn't therapy is just helping a particular person get over a particular fear a particular confluence of fears that have just paralyzed them or whatever it is uh it has to be original and it has to create language okay so here's the issue of, well, if you're in touch with the universe, it shouldn't be original, right? It should be the same old, same old. Yeah. Uh, okay. So how can you fit those together? Well, because any one particular person is in touch with that broader reality in a different way. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it can't really communicate unless you have this common broader reality but they're saying it in a different way and so the audience if they're capable of grasping it has this expanded consciousness they can expand their view of the broader universe and human beings relationship to it does that make sense yeah okay all right representation it's not representational right you're not necessarily getting in touch with the universe just by trying to you know paint something that looks exactly like what's in front of you right mm -hmm. so um so your experience of looking at a tree you bring your consciousness to it nobody just stares at a tree <laughs> yeah Okay, that's how humans, again, are different. Um, art and junk. Okay. Um, okay, I think I have, I think, thought of. So let's, let's take literature as an example of art and say that Lovecraft is our subject at, for the sake of this thought. So his art is not... His Who's art? Who, who are you thinking? Lovecraft. So like Lovecraftian stories... Okay. Um, so like, um, oh, it's, what is it? The Shadow of Innsmouth, where it's fish people. I think that's the one um, where it is clearly not about the, or it like, it is about the people in the town turning into like fish people and being a part of this cult. But it is the thing it's calling to is like the fear of unknown and in the ocean that we don't know. And that is, that is, the representation so it's it's so the tree is like the cult and the actual plot of the story but then the um the representation is of the actual 
like message, like what you, he is actually trying to show you is terrifying. Like, What's the plot? So in, I think it's Shadow of Ben Smith, um, essentially this, this guy um, goes to this town and it's like a fishing town. And eventually he finds out that there's like fish people and everybody there turns into like this sort of fish hybrid. And um, he's like run out of town. And then he traces his family roots back to that town and then goes back and slowly becomes just one of the townspeople that worships this like fish deity guy. And he becomes part of the kind of like cult there. And a lot of what ha a lot of the fear that gets pulled up is a of different like different peoples because Lovecraft was incredibly racist and it comes off in his works. But another one is to fear the ocean because there is so much unknown, and that's one of the points of a lot of his work. So the fear of the ocean is the representation, but the fear of the people is the um, is like the tree, I think. Um, okay, so are the people afraid of the ocean, the fish people? The fish people are not. Right. They're in touch with, like, they're in, they're not afraid of the natural world, but. Yeah, but. He is. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can look at it that way. Maybe, a, what's, what's another example? Um, Okay, um, Romeo and Juliet, like we talked about the other day, where it's technically about this love story between Romeo and Juliet, but in reality, it's about the, um, what was it, the futility of, of generational feuds. Right, that Eros love is really blind to all this yeah. socially constructed crap. Yeah, yes. And okay. so it does get you in touch, right? I mean, you know, we're born to love. We're not born to separate ourselves in all these ways that are so uh, corrupt, right? Yeah. So it, I think it does make you want to reconsider. Yeah, racism and every kind of tribalism, right? Yeah. And that's true. I mean, I've seen, um, I saw a white, I call them hill people. Okay. I don't like hillbilly because it's got all these stereotypes. Yeah. But just people whose relatives lived in the hills. Right. And I saw him proposing on his knee to a Latino woman <laughs> while I was running around Bryant Lake. And it yeah. was, really funny because she was sort of putting him off uh and it's just like well men i don't blah blah and he's just but i'm asking you <laughs> and then i also saw a guy propose to a chinese woman in a restaurant once just kind of really <laughs> but um but in both cases you know it was overcoming racism yeah um, but on the other hand, with the Chinese guy, I really was suspicious that the reason he was so attracted to her was she hardly knew English and she would be completely dominated by him. You know, he could completely control her. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but again, you could make a movie of that little scene, you know, and just it would make people think about stuff, right? all sorts of stuff. Um, does he sincerely love her? Does he, in his conscious mind, he loves her, but he's got these subliminals, you know, he really likes control and he doesn't want to admit that he likes, you know I mean? Just all that kind of stuff that yeah. I think people do talk about. And it's good to talk about it because it gets you to know yourself and it gets you to understand other people. And it gets you to understand spousal abuse and you know it's just always educational does yeah. that make sense yeah yeah um so that would be a case where if i were an artist <laughs> i would 
over, you know, I would see that and I would, gee, gee I want to write a short story about that or gee, I want to make a movie actually that that's part of the movie. And that is how artists are, right? They do run into a situation and they think, yeah, this is, I really want to do something with this. Does that make sense? Yes. Like Toni Morrison, beloved, she read an article about a woman who had escaped with her kids. And then the, she saw the slave owner had found her and she stabbed her kids. She killed her kids um, to save them from slavery. But the book is about her, you know, years later and her consciousness is so blown. I mean, I remember it was a really hard book to read and about halfway through, I figured out, oh, this is what the mind of a woman like that would be like. Tortured, divided, having flashbacks all the time. Yeah. So that was really interesting. Um, anyway, I mean, I, I just think we can't live without real art. Does that make sense, Liam? Yeah. But, oh my gosh, I, when I look at college students, I just don't know how much do they expose themselves to all this junk? And are they, you know, like, I just don't know. I yeah. like teaching college students because they aren't formed yet and they haven't become hard hearted, most of them, or set in their ways, you know? But, you know, I like to like, you should think of these ideas maybe, you know, and then you would start being more deliberate about what you do expose yourself to. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how you strengthen your character, right? Um, okay, so we went through the art and junk, art and entertainment, we went through magic, we went through all that quite a bit. Uh, purpose of art, self-knowledge, knowledge of the world. Um, and it's always involves consciousness. It expands and purifies consciousness. What is beauty? What is the creative process? Um, the, okay, so there's, a, I, I admit there's a lot of questions here, but they're all related to each other. And, and you can't really, you need to ask all of them because they all really are part of the whole experience of art. But the yeah. relation between art and the artist well, the, the, um, and the work of art. Well, it's the experience and the work is like the corpse, right? That yeah. it, and then the artwork and the audience, the audience has to try and use that corpse to get inside of the original experience of the artist, right? Um, and the artist needs to try to communicate with someone because they think it's important. Um, but sometimes the audience just isn't capable of understanding that because they've never gone there. Mm -hmm. All they can do is react to the colors or the shapes. Um, but yeah, okay, so this is where it's, it's CDs, movies, watching something on a computer is just not the same. Does yeah. that make sense? And the other thing I think about is, you know, people can work at home. So they can have jobs where they never interact with anybody else at work. And again, something is lost there, right? Uh, empathy and the ability to interact with other people. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's some things that are gained, but that's where I just really like public schools because you have to interact with people. It's yeah. like a mini city. And it's important that, that the public schools did make sure every kid was stimulated at their level, right? So they did have to have tracking because you can't dumb down things. But just having my kids interacting, rubbing elbows with people that eventually they're going to have to get along and govern. That was so important. And that's just, I think the majority of schools, kids are more segregated by race now than they were during Brown versus Board because of class, okay? Yeah. Class is the ultimate divider now because you can have, you know, there's 
people from India come to become doctors in the US because they crank out twice as many med doctors as they have spaces for. And so sure you can get, oh, we're a racially diverse, you know, suburb where the houses cost a million bucks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's such a joke. Anyway, I mean, it's really a problem, I think. Um, what's the purpose of criticism? And that's because the artists can't always understand whether they've been corrupted or not. The trouble yeah. is the critic is corrupt, right? There's that whole failure to really do it. Uh, and then what is the philosophy of art? So I think Collingwood, you know, there is a role for philosophy of art also. It isn't just hyper intellectualizing if, if it's done well. Does that make sense? Yeah. Art and nature, art and culture, art and science, art and politics, propaganda, you're using those skills for the wrong end. Art and religion, right? Um, it can be the art skills can be subsumed to religious ends and then it becomes magic. Does that make sense? It's not art anymore. Yeah. Art and philosophy. If it becomes hyper intellectualizing and basically all it is is detaching yourself from emotions, then it's it's bogus. Mm -hmm. It's just designed to help you forward your career or some damn thing. Um, but there is a way that it can be art. Art and education versus manipulation. Art and ethics, art and reason, art and psychology, art and truth. Um, what's the difference between aesthetic and all other kinds of experience? Okay, so um, we have 10 minutes. Um, does that make sense? You can, again, go back over that list and see how everything fits together. Um, what about Berger? All right, so which chapters did you read? Did you read, I had you read chapter one through four. Yeah. Um, did you read the first one about seeing? I, I'm gonna be honest, I don't think the first chapter of what I read was about seeing. Okay, yeah, it doesn't sound like it. it sounds, okay, let me just get you, when you get the book, um, so today's Wednesday. Yeah, you should have it. Then I'm going to have to do a, what? My own lecture. Oh, yeah. So it'll be a whole week from today before we have another class. And I guess we'll have to do, you know, Berker. But anyway, so it's all about seeing. What is seeing? And this stuff is interesting, right? But we don't see the way other animals see. We just have to admit it, that what we literally see with our eyeballs is filtered through what's in our heads, right? Yeah. We're establishing a place in the world. Uh, animals don't think about stuff like that. They have a place, but they don't think about it. Yeah. Whereas little kids, from when they're little, they think about it, right? Mm -hmm. They pay attention to who, what's going on around them and they react in unique ways, right? Where animals, they might pay attention, but their options are much more limited. You know, yeah. they don't do weird stuff. <laughs> yeah. But a kid, if they've been taught fear, if they've been yelled at, they will have a very different reaction to other kids or to situations than a kid that's been taught to love and, and trust people. So, you know, I mean, there's a sense in which our awareness of choice and our awareness of vulnerability and our need for love really screw us up. You know, kids can get really screwed up. Um, where in a species, any other species, if their parents or their situation is that unnatural, they just die, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're able to be very unnatural and still survive, <laughs> which, yeah, <laughs> it's, 
all we have is a, is a much deeper responsibility. We don't, we're not superior. We're just more complicated. Um, anyway, so thinking about seeing, it's not simply a reaction to stimuli. So we're back to the brain in a vat, right? Yeah. That this guy would cut, Berger would not like the brain in the vat. Does that make sense? Yes. Seeing is a, um, a mental, spiritual, uh, uh, imaginative experience, right? And brains and vats don't have this. It involves consciousness. Now that fits with Collingwood, right? Does that make sense? Yes. So this is why, you know, I, I read a lot of books and I figured out how to do one, do them in an order where they are talking to each other. Um, consciousness of seeing includes consciousness of being seen. Again, you know, you think of how little a kid is when they start being conscious of all this stuff. Uh, it's reciprocal. All images are man-made or human-made. Okay, images are a site which, a, you know, you see something, but it's been recreated or reproduced. Um, so in your mind, it gets filtered through your consciousness. But then when you're painting or something, it's detached from place and time. Um, and every image em embodies a way of seeing. See. It depends on the seer. Your ability to appreciate an image depends upon right your ability uh it depends upon all these assumptions uh, which are don't have i mean which are usually socially constructed so the key is is there any way to cut through the social constructions but Berger, i think would be called a deconstructionist because he's deconstructing right all these assumptions that art historians have and all this Okay, so think of this is really, you know, you hear people talking about our founding fathers, blah, right? Or back in the good old days, blah. Or they'll say, yeah, the past was crappy because they didn't have science, right? They didn't have, you know, look what we have now. It's so much better, right? People really reconstruct the past in radically different ways. Does that make sense? Yes. And it's motivated by their hopes and fears, right? And their whole philosophy, their ideas of good and evil and um, flourishing and failing to flourish, right? And lots of times they're not even aware of how many assumptions they're bringing into their understandings of stuff. Yeah. Or... They might be vaguely aware, but I mean, the layers and layers, how profound this is. That's what a philosopher is going to say. Wait a second. Why don't you think about <laughs> like these 50 different things that it implies with your little assumption about something? It assumes they then assume things about politics and ethics, and economics, and, you know, all this stuff. Um, all right. So how many people do live in the past because they can't deal with the present, right? Um, mm -hmm. Fear of the present leads to mystification of the past. That, you can understand that, can't you, Liam? Yes. As a Southerner, I can yes. definitely understand that. Yes, I, I do think, you know, slavery really, really has crippled the U.S. Um, but, and it wasn't the Southerners' fault necessarily. I mean, there's a couple politicians and that's kind of it. Yeah. But anyway, so then we had these examples. Um, so when you get the book, you'll see them. It's very interesting. The art, he quotes from the art historians. And I think the art historians to me are obviously crap. You know, they're obviously doing what he says. They're yeah. mystifying things and... Have you read a, a lot of art history? I've read some art history, um, not much. I think the main art history, most of the art history I've read is was about, um, it was it was parallel to AP European history because in my AP Euro class, we used art to like follow, follow along. So that way we could like visually see 
different eras. Um, plus it would really help when like we'd hear a name and we'd be like, I don't remember what they did, but I know what their portrait looks like. And I'm pretty sure they were at Habsburg. Yeah. Or okay. something like that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I actually spent some time in Prague, Budapest and Vienna. That was the Habsburg empire, you know? Yeah. And that's all really interesting. Um, anyway, so, so, um, so I like Berger's um, analysis and his critique of the art historians. It's just that I don't, I don't like, or I don't think he has an adequate way to talk about moving forward, right? It's yeah. much easier to, to break everything down than it is to come up with, well, what, what is your view? You know, uh, what's the truth according to you? What's beauty according to you, right? Does that make yeah. sense? What is this perspective that you have that's enabling you to trash everything else? Um, but that's the second, that's later on. Okay, so the Renaissance made everything material, right? So the mm -hmm. Middle Ages was mystification through religion and it was magic and all that stuff. Then the Renaissance, everything became visual. Um, so this, you know, this is analogous to when Collingwood sort of talks about the past. Um, I mean, all this stuff is really interesting. This one essay too is, I think, what you were talking about: men and women. Yes. Men act, women appear. Mm -hmm. Men, the paintings project their power. Mm -hmm. Um, what they can do to you, or to other people, and the women is her attitude toward herself: what can and cannot be done to her. Um, images of nakedness. And then vanity. Oh my gosh. I, you know, I think you're gonna like this book and the pictures in the book, right? He has a picture of vanity. Yeah, just going off of the news articles, it 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 seemed really fun. Yeah, those that did you read? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I I got the articles because those were there and I was like, I can definitely read this and I know it's right. Yeah, good. You know, it took a while to find all that stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, oil painting, um, just the secularization of society is important. Um, and all right, it's you'll you'll have to you'll have to do it. Um, yes. And as soon as it's in. yeah, these are the women who are fighting against beauty standards. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, this is well. This one I read because I could. Right, and right. I, I liked the contrast and the images that they chose. Um, and it, it just made me think more about different representations. Um, and, and as you were talking about the, um, the, well, the way men, ah, men are versus women in representations of painting. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to look up a painting. I can see if I got the the name right. That's not it. Uh, there it is. Um, Stenchik. I can't remember. Um, I'll I'll email the, the painting to you but it's it's a painting of essentially this court jester that just received news of the loss of Smolensk in a, a war that I can't remember and while there's a party going on behind him he is entirely solemn and it seems evident that like the entire it seems pretty clear that the point of the painting is that he is solitary in the fact that he can't act that he can't act against this this loss of life for his country um, and it, it's, it's a pretty depressing painting. Um, sure. he has to play the role of a jester and he's actually a human being. Yeah. Who's not only that, person. not only that, but also the fact that he is the one that now has to deliver this news to the, the revelers behind him. Um, and it's a, it's a great painting, but 
it, it, I think that even though he is inactive and he can't do anything, it is still a matter of whether he, what, what he is acting upon. And that is, um, I think that that completely contrasts what most depictions of women would be, especially in the era. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. And then did you read this guy's, um, this book about Modigliani? He goes, the woman's pose is completely unselfconscious, offering herself to the observer's eye. Oh my God. Yes. I, oh. yeah, I read that and I felt, I couldn't tell what year it was written in, but I definitely knew it wasn't recently. Yeah, right. And then it fits so well with Berger when he talks about nudity, yeah. right? And so when you read Berger's stuff about nudity, nudity is an outfit, really. And it talks about what women will allow it to be done to them. And yeah. then this guy who has all these credentials, he's this world famous art critic. He's just exactly one of those bullshitters, you know? And I just can't, oh my God. All it is is he spends his whole day wallowing in this fantasy of lust and getting all this credit from, for it from the Academy, right? Yeah. Oh, I just can't stand it. And, you know, to, to, for women to be outraged about that is fine. But that's not just a negative thing. That's the trouble. What about the positive? Like, who are women really, right? Yeah. Um, and, and then, so, and again, when the women just look ugly, that's not enough, right? Mm -hmm. Women aren't just anti-beauty, right? Yeah. They are their own person. And then this, did you read this review? Um, uh, yes, I read the whole, all 14, I think. Did this make sense fitting in with the main theme of what it's still all about what's they still relied on men for the solutions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It again, it's, or not again. Um, it seems like our point for right now is definitely going to be uh, sexist representations in, in art, which is always fun. Yeah. And by always fun, I mean, always painful but at least interesting yeah but we definitely need more art where women really are flourishing right yeah promising thought, woman i thought there would be way more women protagonists i mean i've known this stuff for 50 years yeah. and it just hollywood just didn't go there it's not where the money is have you seen a movie called i think it is a promising young woman No, oh, but I mean, yeah. And then the latest Little Women, right, is more, yeah. more that way. It's just like, why do we have to be fishing for stuff? I mean, half of the movies ought to be about wonderful, powerful women doing great things. Yeah. With women protagonists and not even close, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not even necessarily getting better. Yeah. So it's it's worrisome because that causes behavior you know that embeds itself in the collective unconscious and it's just a constant corrupting influence constantly it just doesn't let up mm -hmm. and so whenever people have those intense experiences of falling in love or whatever it's so corrupted by patriarchy yeah People either adapt and accept what's unacceptable, I think, or they just go through a lot of pain and confusion. Mm -hmm. <sighs> we know better, right? We should know better than that. Yeah. Um, we can know better and still do wrong. That is, that is our, in our capability as Right, As, but you can learn from your mistakes. It's just a lot of people don't think it's a mistake, right? Yeah. Oh, well. All right, so I'll see you, what, a week from today? Um, Monday, yes. And I will have read... Not Monday, uh, not, Wednesday. Oh, Wednesday, yes. Oh, my goodness, yes. It is Wednesday, and it is next Wednesday. Okay, yeah, next Wednesday. Hopefully, my book should get in 
very soon. It's been. Why don't we write, you know, three way emails to make sure we're all on the same page? Yeah. I literally. I mean, I'm, I'm going to send an email to myself telling me that. Okay. And send it to Ivy too, and we can okay. get her on board here. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll see you. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.